Good morning. Let's turn in God's word this morning to the book of Ruth. And in contrast to what you're expecting, I'm afraid we're turning to chapter 1, not 2. Now, we will get to 2, Lord willing. But you know how it is sometimes at school. I'm sure it wasn't the case with you. But with, there are always those students that don't get their work done in the time allotted to them. And so they have to come in the next day and catch up on their work. And so I have to catch up on a couple of things in chapter 1 if we're going to understand chapter 2 properly. But chapter 2 is what we are going to be thinking about as well. Ruth chapter 1, and we're going to begin at verse number 19. Ruth chapter 1 and verse 19. Now the two of them went until they came to Bethlehem, and it happened when they had come to Bethlehem that all the city was excited because of them. And the women said, Is this Naomi? But she said to them, Do not call me Naomi. Call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, and the Lord has brought me home again empty. Why do you call me Naomi, since the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has afflicted me? So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, with her, who returned from the country of Moab. Now they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of barley harvest. Now we saw last night that there was this measure of independence. And as much as we love as a nation the concept of independence, the 4th of July is coming up soon, we call that Independence Day. But for the believer, independence is a bad thing. What I mean is, as we're going to see today in chapter 2 especially, that the pathway of the believer is to be dependent on the Lord. And our hymns already have prepared us very well for that concept. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. And we think about uh, the, the uh, He Leadeth Me, the other hymn we sang, and that dependence on the Lord, looking to Him for guidance and for leading. And so they're appropriate songs we've sung, and I'm sure the ones in Malayalam were as well. Uh, I'm going to have to take the Malayalam hymn book and put it under my pillow and see if any osmosis can work this weekend. But it's beautiful and rhythmic to listen to, even if I'm not catching all the words. I'm grateful to our brother for the summaries he gave. But in any case, we see that because of their independence, Elimelech and his family came into a problem. And really, Naomi sort of crystallizes the issue here by saying, I went out full, and the Almighty has brought me again empty. Now that's really the story of the book of Ruth. How there's an emptiness that by the end of the book gets filled. And another hymn writer says, Emptied that thou shouldest fill me, a clean vessel in thy hand. See, that's what we need to be as believers. We need to be emptied of ourselves. And we need to be filled with the fullness that is in the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is something that Ruth and Naomi had to learn by experience, especially Naomi. Ruth was, as we saw, a convert. Ruth was a Gentile, a stranger to the covenants of promise, without God, to use the language of Ephesians 2. And yet she saw in Naomi a reality. She saw in Naomi's God something she wanted. And so she said, entreat me not to leave thee. Your God is going to be my God. Your people are going to be my people. Now think of that. That's an amazing testimony when you realize that here this Israelite woman, Naomi, at that moment in time, naturally speaking, has nothing. She has no husband to protect her. She has no sons to care for her. She has no, what we call today, safety net. She is indigent. She is realizing, if I'm going to survive, I've got to go back to Bethlehem. I've got to go back to where I started. 
I've got to return to where I've heard the Lord is now blessing. But naturally, she's got nothing to offer. And she's explicit about that with Ruth. But Ruth nonetheless sees in her God, sees in the faith of Naomi, sees in the faith that Naomi was reared in, sees in the promises of her land, something that she wants. Because even though there may be food in Moab, even though she may have her husband's house in Moab, even though there may be other gods in Moab, they're not the same as the God of Israel. He's the true and living God. He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the one who said that through Abraham's seed he would bless all nations of the earth. And Ruth is saying, I, I'm not going on what I can see here. We walk by faith and not by sight, 2 Corinthians 5 tells us. And Ruth at the very beginning shows us what faith is about. I can't see anything naturally why I should hitch my wagon to Naomi, how this is going to benefit me materially, how this is going to help me survive. In fact, people naturally speaking would look at this and say, that's a really daft thing to do. That's really foolish. And yet, she was putting her faith in Naomi's God. A God who had called a people out from the earth. A God who was different from the gods of men because the gods of men are but idols. The gods of men are wood and stone, but our God made the heavens, the psalmist says. And Ruth sees that reality. Even though at that moment, Naomi is not a great example of a believer. She's knocked down. She's despondent. She's depressed. She's empty. But that's the exact position where God wants us to be because that's where he can come in and say, now I'm ready to fill you. See, you remember Moses, one of the great heroes of the faith, right? Now, why was Moses one of the great heroes of the faith? Well, he was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, the greatest superpower of the world of that time, one of the richest civilizations that's ever existed. You go to any museum in any major city just about in the Western world, and they have some kind of Egypt collection, not to mention in Egypt itself, you go to Cairo, whoo, it's tremendous. You go in and you see the gold and the silver and all of that bling, you know. It was this immense, rich, educated society. And Moses was learned in all of their wisdom. He had a degree from, you know, the University of Houston, or he had a degree from the UT at Austin, or he had a degree from wherever you matriculated from. I just don't have time to go through all your alma maters. You know, he graduated summa cum laude, highest honors. He had all of that education. And what's more, he was well-born. He was one of the nobility. He was called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, or at least he could have been called that. But when he came of age, Hebrews 11 says, by faith he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. And he chose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, or as some translate it, the passing pleasures of sin. He made a decision. Now you remember that his life, this is great for me who was a history major, we're famously not good at math, at least I'm not good at math, but it breaks down really simply. He lived 120 years, that's three 40-year blocks. So we've got 40 years in Egypt, 40 years in the backside of the desert in Midian. Where did God take him? Well, the ancient equivalent of Birdsboro, Pennsylvania. That's where I live, okay? People in my county, don't even know where Birdsboro is, all right? You know, you blink, you missed it. I think we have two traffic lights, but it's, it's not a bustling metropolis. It's not a great city. There are not a lot of famous denizens of Birdsboro who have gone out into the world and done grandiose things for civilization. It's a little town like so many other little towns where you can be perfectly obscure if you want to be, and most of us are. And there was Moses on the backside of the desert. He's taking care of these sheep. 
And you say, boy, that's a come down for a university educated man, isn't it? I mean, this isn't, you know, everybody thought he'd take one of the proper occupations, that he'd become a doctor or an engineer or that he'd work in IT. Again, I hope I hit your profession, but we just only have so much time this morning. You know, that he'd have one of those really good jobs. But instead, he was a shepherd. What we'd call a dirty job. Menial work. No disrespect whatsoever against agriculture or against shepherding but in the ancient world it didn't have the romanticism that we've later attached to it maybe it was a dirty kind of lonely job and it was hard work and it was physical work and nobody cared about what Moses had studied in college in that line of work it was can you care for the sheep can you protect them from predators can you get them to water Can you take care of their needs? Which turned out to be exactly the right kind of training that he needed. Because for the last 40 years of his life, he was used of God to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt. Now, so often you see that in the Bible, that I think it was Tozer who said, before God greatly uses a man, he first breaks him. And whether it was him or someone else, that's a truism. And that is... Something we can say, yes, there's wisdom in that. Because the problem is that when we think we're somebody or we think we can do it or when we think I've got this, then we're living in independence of God or partial dependence on God, perhaps. But what God wants is complete and utter dependence. He wants us to walk by faith and not by sight. And walking by faith means we trust in the Lord, not just we tick off the right doctrinal boxes mentally, but in our daily life, we seek the Lord. Not just what I am in the assembly on Sunday, but how I live Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday, Thursday, and most of the time on Friday, and yes, all of Saturday. That God wants it all, that the Lord Jesus said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. What things was he talking about? Well, what things that the Gentiles worry about? You know, making a living, having enough to wear, having a place to live, all that sort of thing. You put the Lord first and the Lord's going to help you do those things. The Lord's going to even use you in your job to glorify the Lord. Because in the mind of the Lord, there's no sacred and secular distinction. It should be a life lived for God. That whatever we do, as Colossians says, we do all in the name of the Lord. So if I'm doing my job, if I'm a plumber, let's say, or I'm an IT professional and I'm doing coding or whatever they do, it's all beyond me. But anyway, you know, if I'm a doctor and I'm doing something or a nurse or a school teacher or whatever my job is, I'm a Christian in that job. I'm doing the best I can. I'm not cutting corners. I'm not cheating. I'm not being dishonorable. Because I'm depending on the Lord even in my day-by-day work. And we're going to see that's the kind of ethic that Ruth brings to the table in chapter 2. Now, when Naomi comes back to the land, uh, we read here in verse number 19 uh, that they came back and the city, it says... All the city was excited because of them. And it reminds me of the statement in Matthew 21, where the Lord Jesus comes up to Jerusalem for the last time prior to the crucifixion. He's coming up for the last week of his life on earth before dying on the cross and rising again. And the whole city is troubled about his presence. Everybody's talking about him. And there's kind of this division about him. Is he of God or is he a charlatan? Is he a blasphemer or is he really a prophet? Is he the Messiah? There's all this discussion about him. And in similar fashion, as they come up to Bethlehem, the whole city's talking about Naomi. Guess who's back? Naomi's back. Can you believe it? After more than a decade, here she is. She's back. Now, I don't know if you've had things that happen in your life where people haven't seen you for a long time and suddenly you come back again. And when they saw Naomi, it was evident that there was a change. Probably as 
Uh, Brother Ray said before probably that she came back dressed differently than they would have expected. Maybe she looked different, but the attitude certainly was different. Look at verse 20. She said, do not call me Naomi. Now remember the, na- the beautiful meaning of that lovely name. Naomi means my pleasantness. But she says, don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara, which you know means bitter. And here, there's an opportunity where she comes back and everybody wants to know, what's going on with Naomi? Here's Naomi. You call me Naomi? That's a laugh. Pleasantness? Oh, sorry, child. The pleasantness ran out of my life a long time ago. Nobody knows the troubles I've seen, you know? I've just had problem after problem and difficulty. Don't call me Naomi. Don't call me my pleasantness. Call me bitter. Call me bitter. Now, there was a place called Mara in Israel's history where when they came out of Egypt, one of the first places they encountered, I believe it's in Exodus 16, maybe it's 15, they come to a stream called Mara. But they can't drink of the stream because the waters are bitter. That's a really terrible thing, isn't it? When you come to a stream and it looks refreshing and you say, oh, I'd like a drink of that. And and you put it in your mouth and it tastes awful. You know, you're looking for refreshment, but maybe it's salty. And it's not refreshing, it's bitter. And she says, don't call me Naomi, call me bitter. Why? For the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full and the Lord has brought me home again empty. Now, listen, brothers and sisters, let me tell you this morning, we'd all like to be Joseph, right? I'm sure if Joseph got up in the morning for a 645 devotional, uh, and I'm going to pray for the conveners of this conference for doing that, but anyway, it was a good word. But unlike Brother Ray, I'm not a morning person, so I enjoyed the word, but Naomi had to get out that belt that Brother Ray mentioned to get me out of bed. There you are. Uh, True confessions. But anyway, you know, I'm sure Joseph was the kind of guy that when he got out of bed at 645 in the morning, his hair was perfect. You know, because there's really nothing bad said about Joseph. In fact, when his brothers come and they say, now, uh, please don't do anything to us, Joseph. You know, dad said before he died that you shouldn't, Now take your vengeance on us. And Joseph comforted them. And what was Joseph's statement? Oh, he was a great practical theologian. He said, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Now, brothers and sisters, we all want to be Joseph. We'd all like to think that when our business tanks, that when we lose our job, when the doctor gives us the negative diagnosis, that we say, blessed be the name of the Lord. We'd all like to think, yes, I can see God's hand here, that I'm so thankful that God has brought me to this trial. That like James 1 says, when you fall into various trials, count it all joy, my beloved brethren. We'd all like to think that we do that. But I'll tell you the truth. Sometimes I feel like Naomi, and I don't mean my wife. If I felt like her, I'd be a better Christian. I feel like this, Naomi. Sometimes when the problem hits, I say, Lord, what are you doing? Aren't you supposed to bless me? Isn't this supposed to be about happiness? Isn't the fruit of the Spirit joy? Lord, why have you brought this hardship into my life? The Lord, the Almighty, notice her recognition of God's power, of his mightiness, the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. Except we remember how she got to this point. This is a little bit of revisionist history. Now, I'm not blaming her because, as I say, sometimes I've been there myself. That the problem comes, and right away you want to blame the Lord. You wouldn't admit that. You wouldn't go to the assembly and tell the elders, hey, guess what nasty thing the Lord did to me this week? But in your heart as a believer, you might say to yourself, now God, why did you allow this to come to me? I mean, wasn't I trying to be a faithful servant and now this thing hits me? What are you doing with me? 
We, we sometimes can feel that way in our heart. If you never have brother or sister, praise the Lord. You're more on the Joseph side of things. But Ruth is very realistic. This book tells us what people really go through. And as I recall their history, as I said last night, they come to this point. Naomi is at this point of destitution, of having nothing, of being empty of tasting the bitter side of life. She's not there because that's what God, first of all, wanted for them. She's there because they decided, we're going to go off on our own. We're going to do our own thing. There's famine in Bethlehem. To us, it's not the house of bread. At least we can't see that right now. So rather than wait around for God to do something, we're going to leave. No prayer. No seeking after godly counsel. We're just going to go over to Moab. This is what makes sense to us. We're going to go and do it. We're going to lean on our own understanding. And as they make those decisions, it inevitably leads them in a pathway that entails greater and greater trouble and greater and greater bitterness. Because I want to tell you, beloved, this morning, that whatever problem comes into your life, it will not get better by you running away from God. It will not get better by you absenting yourself from his assembly. It will not get better by you pulling apart from the believers. It will not get better by you not reading your Bible and not praying. That will only compound your problem. That will only augment your trouble. And that's what we're seeing here. And the Lord is saying to Naomi, Yes, I've brought you again empty and you feel so bitter. But if she could look ahead and see by the end of the book how full God is going to make her, how God really wants to bless her, how God really wants to give her the best, and how God is working out a plan that is much bigger than Naomi's personal life, that Naomi is a very important linchpin in the divine plan that affects the nation of Israel and It affects the world. It affects each one of us. Because this is a key point in the history of God bringing Messiah to earth. Now, too many times, unfortunately, when we come into a trial, we can murmur, we can complain. And again, I know what that's like by experience. And people come to her and they say, is this Naomi? Think of the opportunity she had. The whole city's talking about her. Now, what are they going to talk about? What's the story she's going to leave with them? She could have said, you know, let me tell you, my husband and I, we made a big mistake. We walked away from the people of God. We left the land where God told us to be. We weren't depending on God. We were independent of him. We were doing our own thing. And let me tell you, that's the wrong way to go. That's brought me into deeper and deeper trouble. But now I've repented. Now I've come back and I cast myself on the Lord. So from here forward, be it poverty, sickness, whatever lies in my future, I've learned something from my daughter-in-law, Ruth. Though she's a Moabitess, though she's a foreigner, though she's somebody that the law said should not come into the congregation of Israel up to the 10th generation, she taught me something about God. She came and clinged to me. In fact, many Hebrew scholars say that the name Ruth has the idea of friend or companion. And she was certainly a friendly, loyal companion. She clung to Naomi and said, don't tell me to leave you. And just like Ruth has had that attitude toward me because she knows I know the Lord. That's how I'm going to be toward the Lord as well. I'm going to cling to the Lord. What a testimony that would have been, right? But instead, she says, oh, the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I was full. I went out full. Uh, Excuse me, time out. Pardon me, Miss Naomi, but if you were full, why did you go out in the first place? It's a good question, isn't it? Sometimes it's only in retrospect that you realize how good you had it. You remember the prodigal in Luke 15? That he looks back when he's starving, when he wants to eat the pig food. 
He says, how many of the servants in my father's household have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with this hunger. Look at everything I've given up. Look at how wastefully I've lived. Even the servants in my father's household live better than I do. I'm going to arise and just say to my father, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. I've sinned against heaven and against you. Please just give me a job as a servant. I won't even ask for my sonship back. But the Lord receives him as a son. And the Lord puts the robe on him. And the Lord gives him the ring. And the Lord puts the shoes on his feet. And that's how the Lord is, isn't he? As one of our hymn writers says, he giveth and giveth and giveth again. Oh, the restoring mercy of God. But Naomi couldn't see this yet. She said, I went out full and I've come again empty. So Naomi returned, verse 22 says, and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law with her, returned from the country of Moab. Now, hear that point. It's like a hammer. The Moabitess, Moab, Moab, Moab. These are people that are strangers. These are people that don't have the promises of God. So you have an Israelite woman who has circumstantially lost her inheritance in Israel. She's lost the land that her husband Elimelech had. She's lost her husband indeed. And there's this question, is his name going to be preserved in Israel? More on that when we get to chapter 3. But this woman comes back having basically nothing, empty as she says, and Ruth, who you might say almost has less than nothing, because she can't come and claim any kind of pride of place as being an Israelite. And yet, as I mentioned last night, God over and over again, even in the law, talks about the stranger and the widow and the orphan. Because in contrast to what humanity thinks of God, by and large, God is kind. God is compassionate. God is loving. God cares about the weak and the vulnerable. And he invites the stranger. In fact, Israel was designed to be a light to the nations. To show them that the God of Israel was different. He wasn't like the idols that led them into all kinds of sordid behavior and immorality and destruction and devaluing of life. But the God of Israel was a God who promised life and life more abundantly because the best kind of life is the life for which we were created, to know our creator. This is how the Lord Jesus defined eternal life. He said in John 17, 3, this is life eternal, that they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. So eternal life isn't primarily about a place, heaven, isn't primarily about streets of gold or gates of pearl, or even not dying or not sorrowing or not suffering. That's all fringe benefits, if you would put it that way. But heaven is about the Lord Jesus. It's about knowing God through his son. It's about enjoying him and becoming like him. That's the very essence of eternal life. And that's what God was always wanting for his people that they might come and walk with him. That's what God has wanted from Genesis 3 onwards, this relationship with human beings. Now, as bad and as bleak, humanly speaking, as things look to Naomi and Ruth at the end of chapter 1, there is one little glimmer of hope, but we might miss it if we read too quickly. Look at the last sentence of chapter 1. Now they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of barley harvest. And you say, what's so encouraging about that? Well, on the one hand, uh, at the historical practical level, it's very encouraging because Leviticus 19 and also Leviticus 23 talks about the fact that they should leave the corners of their fields ungleaned for the widow, for the stranger, for the orphan. So this is an excellent time to come back. If you need charity, if you need somebody to help you out, if you're hungry... This is a great time to come back because the time of the barley harvest. So you can do what we see Ruth doing at the beginning of chapter 2. You can say, let me go out and find somebody's field to glean in. It's the barley harvest. But what's more than that, the barley harvest 
corresponds to an annual holiday in Israel. Leviticus 23 talks about it. It's called the Feast of First Fruits. Now you remember their religious calendar, which followed harvest festivals, their religious calendar began with Passover, what a Jewish person would call Pesach. And Passover spoke about redemption. It's about when they remembered how they became a nation. Because God redeemed them by blood and by power. By blood, he saved them from the plague of death that was falling on Egypt. And by power, he saved them through the Red Sea from the army of Pharaoh. And he brought them into a promised land eventually, didn't he? He saved them to give them a different kind of life. That's what the next feast, which was held right, you know, back to back with Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, a seven-day feast. But also during that, Three days after the Passover, there would be this feast of first fruits, where they would take the first sheaf of the barley harvest and they would bring it into the presence of the Lord. They'd take it to the tabernacle or later the temple and they would wave it before the Lord. Now, when you wave something before the Lord in the Bible, symbolically you're giving it to the Lord. And they'd lay up that first stalk, the first fruits of their barley harvest. What they were saying was, Lord, our harvest, the fact that we're about to get all this barley, it comes from you. And before we enjoy it, before we ever have our portion, you've got to have your portion. And first fruits spoke of a great harvest that was then going to follow in the succeeding months. But when the New Testament picks up these ideas, it ties them to Christ. 1 Corinthians 5 will take Passover and unleavened bread, and it will say that's what the Lord Jesus Christ is for us. Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed for us. In other words, as Ephesians 1, 7 says, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins, through his blood, according to the riches of his grace. We've been redeemed by the Passover lamb, the one that John 1, 29 says, behold the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And that's where your life with God has to start. It has to start with meeting the Redeemer, with receiving him for yourself, with saying Christ has been sacrificed for me, the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me, as Galatians 2.20 says. But that leads to the Feast of Unleavened Bread, leavened in the Bible, speaking of evil, either moral evil, as in 1 Corinthians 5, or sometimes, as in Matthew 16, speaking of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, it's talking about doctrinal evil. And either way, the life that God saves us to is a life that is unleavened. In other words, it's a life of holiness. A life where we're to feed on something that's different from what we fed on before we met the Lord Jesus Christ. That's different from the, what this world feeds on. That we say, I want to be holy because he is holy. I want to please my Lord. I want to become more and more like him. I want to be conformed to his image. That's what salvation is all about. But when we get to 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20, he picks up that feast of first fruits. Now remember, that's the barley harvest. That's the time when Naomi and Ruth are coming back to the land. Now what does 1 Corinthians 15, 20 say about the feast of first fruits? It says, now has Christ risen from the dead, the first fruits of them that sleep. You say, oh, well, that means that the Lord Jesus Christ is the first person in history to rise from the dead, never to die again. Well, that's absolutely true. He's the first person to rise into what the Bible calls the power of his resurrection, the, the resurrected life. That's the power that works in every believer, according to Ephesians 1. The power that takes us from being sinners, from being separated from God, and positionally, the moment we believe in Christ, it lifts us up and seats us in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. It's the power that's already working in us, and it's a power that won't be thwarted, even though we might die, yet we shall live, because Jesus is the resurrection and the life. And he's going to raise us from the dead. And this salvation not only is going to raise our soul and spirit, but these very bodies will be transformed. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, 1 Corinthians 15 goes on to say, will be transformed. Philippians 3 says the bodies of these humiliation will be exchanged for glorious bodies like unto his body. And that's what first fruits is all about. 
Christ was sacrificed on Passover. He laid down his life. And then three days later, Christ was lifted up in the presence of God. Not in the form of some sheaves out of the field, no. He was literally, physically lifted up. Lifted up from the grave, first of all. And eventually, lifted up into the very presence of God. Hebrews says he's seated on the right hand of the majesty on high. 1 Peter 3.22 says, Christ has entered into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, angels and principalities and powers being made subject to him. So when we talk about first fruits, this is the resurrection of Christ. Christ is the first one. But 1 Corinthians 15 says there's going to be a tremendous harvest. Many, many people that will be saved and raised. Whereas Hebrews 2 says many sons to glory. So they come back at a time. (coughs) Excuse me. Symbolically speaking that talks about resurrection from the dead. How perfect, right? Right? Because if anybody ever seemed by their life prospects like they were dead, like there was no hope, like everything was lost, everything was gone, it's Naomi and Ruth. And yet they come back at the time when God's word is eventually going to spell out resurrection from the dead. Now, they didn't know that, of course. We know it because of later revelation in Scripture. But they did know that the word of God in Leviticus said that they could go to these fields and they could glean. And actually it's Ruth that makes the suggestion. But before she does, we ought to have a drum roll. Oh, he's not here, sorry. We ought to have a drum roll as we see Boaz enter in verse 1. Chapter 2, verse 1. Told you we'd get to chapter 2. There was a relative of Naomi's husband, a man of great wealth, of the family of Elimelech, His name was Boaz. Oh, I like the sound of that. (laughs) What is not to like about that verse? He's a relative of Elimelech. The Bible has this concept, you see, of the kinsman redeemer. You can read about it in Leviticus 25, for example. It's also dealt with in the passages in Numbers and Deuteronomy and Joshua about the the cities of refuge in a different respect. But the kinsman redeemer is the person in your family that if you got into financial straits and you had to sell your inheritance, he could buy it back for you. And eventually in the 50th year, the year of Jubilee, that would revert to you. He would save the inheritance from passing out of the family's hands or save it from going to another tribe. And here's the kinsman redeemer. What's more, he's described as a man of great wealth. (laughs) Now, if you're going to be able to redeem, you not only have to have the willingness, you also have to have the means. And here's a man of great wealth. So that bodes well. That's an auspicious beginning, we might say. And lastly, since names are so important in the book of Ruth, Boaz, you remember, was the name of one of the pillars in the temple, Jachin and Boaz. Boaz means, in him is strength. So here is a man of strength, a strength of character, as we'll find out. So that bodes well. We'd call that in literary terms foreshadowing. Verse 2, so Ruth the Moabitess said to Naomi, please let me go to the field and glean heads of grain after him in whose sight I may find favor. And she said to her, go, my daughter. Hmm. Now think of this. Ruth and Naomi, when they came back, the city was stirred about them. And they said, is this Naomi? And that was Naomi's golden opportunity to testify for the Lord. And at that moment, she didn't do a great job, honestly. She kind of blamed her problems on the Lord. She said, the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me, and he's brought me again empty. But in spite of that, we're not going to judge Naomi on a bad moment. We're not going to judge her on something that she said after so much pain. And I'm thankful God doesn't take every word we say and just pin that to us, you know? Now, God isn't always pointing back to some mistake we've made years ago. If we come to the Lord repentantly, there's nothing we've said or done that the Lord can't forgive. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So in spite of her missed opportunity, we might say, at the end of chapter 1, 
It is obvious by inference here that she had taught Ruth some things about the Bible. That she had talked about how good the God of Israel is. That in Israel, people care about the vulnerable. They care about the widows. They care about the orphans. They care about the stranger. Because there's provision in God's word made for these people to come. That's what kind of God he is. And obviously Ruth picked up on that. And now she says, can I go out and do that? Isn't that wonderful? That's what James chapter 1 would call being not only a hearer of the word, but being a doer of the word. And if you want to write over the name of Ruth, Ruth isn't a very long name, but you could write another four-letter word in English, doer. That's what she is. She says, I want to take that promise from the Bible, and I want to plug that in. I want to go out to the field and glean heads of grain after him in whose sight I may find favor. Now, she doesn't know who he is. She says, him in whose sight I'll find favor. In other words, whatever person extends to me the generosity and the kindness of the law of God. Now, we have to remember, this is the time of the judges. You read the book of Judges. It is not Israel's finest hour. It is not a time when women were treated very well. You want to talk about a Me Too moment. There were a lot of times in Judges when women would be afraid to walk on the streets, afraid to go out. And there's some heinous crimes committed against women in the book of Judges. And yet Ruth says, I believe God. I believe his word. I believe he's got to have somebody out there who wants to follow the Bible, who wants to implement what the scriptures say. So let me go out and do that. So verse 3, she left and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the family of Elimelech. Oh, how do you like that for coincidence? Well, there was nothing coincidental about it. Even though the Bible, in anthropomorphic fashion, you know, describing it like we would, says she happened to come to this field. God was arranging the events, of course. She had to go, but God was directing her path. And she went into this field that belonged to Boaz, who was of the family of Elimelech, you remember. Verse 4, now behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said to the reapers, the Lord be with you. The first words out of this man's mouth are a benediction, a blessing in the name of the Lord. The Lord be with you. He is therefore a God-fearing man. He's a spiritual man. He's not afraid to come to work and tell his employees, you know how we run things in this business? We run them for the glory of God. I had a little email interchange with a friend of mine this morning. He's a businessman and a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he is in the car sales business. Right now he's in what they would call pre-owned. Back in the day, when I first met him back in 1994, he owned a large car dealership, well, large for his area anyway. He owned a major car dealership. And the car dealership, as many of them do, had a garage with it. And the people that had owned the dealership prior to his buying it, they had been in the habit of doing some things that were unethical in the garage. Specifically, if you had something go wrong with your car that you bought at their dealership and you brought it to their garage, well, let's say it was something that went wrong with the car that was not under the manufacturer's warranty. They would say, oh, you know, if, if we fix this, we're going to have to charge this fellow $300. But we can write it up as this other thing. We can write it up as something else, create a work order, that says it's actually something else that's going wrong with the car. And that way we can charge this major car corporation and charge them for the work and they'll pay us. The customer doesn't have to pay. They're happy. They'll come back and buy their cars here in the future. Because they, they don't know what's going on behind the scenes. They're just told, hey, this is covered. We'll fix it for you. And my friend, when he discovered this, he said, we're not going to do that any longer. I'm a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. We can't run the business this way. And the man who was in charge of the garage said, you'll never survive in business. 
You don't know how much we're doing back here. He said, I don't care. I belong to the Lord, and that's not how we're going to run the business. And the Lord honored that brother. Now, I have to tell you the truth. In the recession of 2008, 2009, that time period, he eventually had to sell that dealership, and the lot that he's running now is much smaller. His business is much smaller and much curtailed. So the pathway of obedience doesn't always mean that you get the honor and the reward here. But I tell you, that man can sleep at night knowing he runs his business for the Lord. And he's maintained his testimony in that community. And he's led people who've come into his business to Christ and led some of his employees to Christ because of the stand he took. Well, such was Boaz. Such was he in his business dealings. He came and blessed his servants in the name of the Lord. And then he asked the question, verse 5, whose young woman is this? So the servant who was in charge of the reapers answered and said, it is the young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. Now, did you get that? This is the Moabitess. This is the Moabite woman. She's from Moab. How's Boaz going to react to that? Is he going to say, you know, Moab... They're a country that in this time period, they've been our overlords before. They've conquered us before. They've committed atrocities before against our people. Moab, that's an idolatrous people. Even the law says that you're not to marry a Moabitess, not to bring them into the congregation and so forth. He could have rejected her, but that wasn't Boaz's way. As she came and she said, verse 7, please let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and has continued from morning until now, though she rested a little in the house. Now, just for the ladies, I'd just like to make the very simple, practical point that the thing that makes Ruth stand out here is that she is a hard worker. That she is somebody who, yes, believes what God's word says she can do, but she applies herself to that. She goes and she works at it. So she's not saying, now, I believe the Lord will provide for us. I'm going to kick back, you know, and I'm going to watch the Orpah Winfrey show. Oh, sorry, Orpah was somebody else in Ruth. No, I'm going to sit back, you know, and relax and eat bonbons or something. No, she's going out and she's carrying forth what the word of God tells her to do. And and so she comes and she works hard. Now here, Boaz says to her in verse 8, You will listen, my daughter, will you not? Do not go to glean in another field, nor go from here, but stay close by my young women. Let your eyes be on the field which they reap and go after them. Have not I commanded the young men not to touch you? And when you're thirsty, go to the vessels and drink from what the young men have drawn. Now, this man's honorable. This man not only receives her and says, yes, you can have charity. You can have some of the largesse that God has shared with me. I will gladly share it with you. You're a stranger. The word of God makes provision for that. Yes, you can come and take that. But more than that, Boaz says, I want to protect you. I want to keep you from harm. And again, you only have to read the book of Judges to know how dangerous it was for a woman. It's always dangerous for a woman in this fallen world, but how dangerous it was there. And Boaz was a man. He stood up and said, I've made provision that you're going to be secure, that you're going to be protected. Now, the culture we're living in in the West has forgotten what manhood is to be and has forgotten that Men are to be leaders, but leaders aren't dictators in the Bible sense. Leaders are servants. The Lord Jesus, who was our master and Lord, demonstrated his leadership by washing feet. He was the one, as Ephesians 5 will point out, who gave himself for the church, who loved and cherished her like his own body. And the standard put on men, whether we're married or not, is to treat women like that. To be a servant, to lead them in the right way, to do what protects them, what benefits them. Instead of saying, you know, I'm going to take the path of least resistance through life. 
I'm going to do my hobbies, my fun things, my video games, my hunting, my fishing, whatever it is, and all those things can be fine in their place, okay? But I'm just going to live my life, and I'm not going to take on responsibility. No, no, that's not what Boaz was. He was a godly man, and he said, I've commanded my servants not to touch you. You've got a secure, safe space here, and I will provide for you. Now, brothers and sisters, that's a lovely harbinger of things to come. And we'll see tonight the rest of chapter 2 and chapter 3. Chapter 3 is short, so we'll, we'll be able to catch up with no problem. But we'll be able to see how Boaz continues. What he's begun, he's going to faithfully finish. And I can't help but think, and I want to end with this point, that even as Boaz is the man of strength, that we can come to our heavenly Boaz, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we can say, Lord, I'm empty. Lord, I can't make it in this world. Lord, I have no strength. And the Lord says, that's exactly where I want you to be. In your weakness, I demonstrate my strength. When we are weak, he is strong, Paul said in 2 Corinthians 12. Well, I'm going to humble myself, even as you can see Ruth doing that in this passage. And I'm going to depend on you. And even as God used Boaz historically in this book to take care of Ruth and to protect Ruth and to restore to Naomi everything she lost, we're going to find out our Lord will do no less for every believer that he who has begun a good work in you will be faithful to complete it unto the day of Christ Jesus, as Philippians 1 says. And that he will complete everything he's promised to Israel as well. And we see that in Naomi. So God is at work on multiple levels, and just like Boaz, he's strong, and he cares, and he applies that strength to our vulnerability to save and to care for us. Praise be his name.